thing. All right, we are officially also live on Facebook and recording. So we are all set to go. Boom. Good stuff. Well, yeah. hey, what's happening, everybody? We'll go ahead and, uh, and get cracking since it is seven and the 05. Uh, and we'll start, as always, if it's okay with you, Rob and Danielle, with uh, who the heck you are. Uh, I'll start with me. I'm Mark Beckett, uh, partnered with Rob Chavez on this grid networking investing activity lifestyle money train for uh, 10 years now, right? We've been at it for uh, a couple of minutes. Uh, Rob runs uh, a very active large agent team uh, at the Casa Group. Uh, I run our construction and investment activities with rehabs, rentals, uh, obviously construction for ourselves for our deals, some third party work. Uh, for clients. So anyone ever needs uh, any assistance with construction, love to help out anywhere that we can based here out of Northern Virginia uh, and with contacts elsewhere as needed. Uh, and yeah, just looking to network and uh, get ourselves into some deals where we can. Anybody ever has anything uh, they think uh, we might be interested in to look at to acquire, always happy to look at it, looking for rehabs, rentals uh, here, there, and, and everywhere. Uh, so that's what I'm doing. Uh, Rob, who are you? How about ladies first? How about Ooh. Danielle? Who are you, Danielle? Danielle, who are you? Excellent. I am excellent. And I am Danielle Paleski Brown. I am an investor agent uh, and I run the investor division of the Casa Group. So I work with Rob like that. Um, and I work with Mark uh, quite often as well on the construction side because when working with investors or even distressed sellers, there's a lot of uh, renovation cost estimating that actually is part of my job, even though I am not a contractor. Um, I have been with CASA for a, a little over a year now, as well as GRID, and I'm really excited to share my knowledge and uh, meet some of you and see how I can help and work with you going forward. Cool, cool. Good cool. Have you. All right. And Rob, now who are you? I'm, I'm Rob Chavez. Um, I have the privilege of facilitating, helping facilitate, and actually having you guys now facilitate this awesome collaboration that we call the GRID, right? It's about um, co-opetition, not competition. It's about collaboration. And uh, we started this a decade ago with this basic idea of um, together everybody achieves more. The more that we share, the more we create social currency, the more people do deals in the room and all the knowledge, all the resources, all the inspiration you need are within your fingertips, within the database that, that you have right around you in this group. And it's proven to be the, the case, you know, for us over the last 10 years. And, um, you know, this little group is now 15,000 people and we've got chapters all over. And so I feel privileged that we're... Um, we're doing this and we're able to put this on for everybody. So the content that we're gonna provide is very specific to this area, right? To the Northern Virginia, Maryland, DC, or would you say Northern Virginia primarily, Mark? You know, I, I, I'd like to think the information is somewhat universal, but when we talk about what things cost in particular, yeah, yeah know that my costs are based on here, the Northern Virginia, D.C. Metro. But our costs here for things are not that different than certainly most major metro areas, certainly for material. If we're talking about estimating renovations and material, what the depot uh, charges you uh, it, here is the same as Miami and L.A. and Chicago. And the costs have gone up. You know, they have gone considerably. We can talk about that for a second, whether or not maybe that needs to factor into some of our assumptions. But uh, definitely a thing. Uh, but yeah, we're obviously operating here this evening uh, out of the uh, kind of DC metro area, uh, but kind of all, all applies. Uh, I see some chats coming in, which actually is a really good time to point out a couple of things in that chat box, which may be flashing in orange on your screen. If you open it up, uh, that is where you can ask questions if you want. That's where you can share contact information. You'll see Danielle's information there. Rob and I will both do the same. And then at the end of this presentation, if you look at the bottom of that chat screen, there's three little boxes, three little uh, dots. You click on the three little dots thing, you can actually save this chat uh, so that anyone's information that you see 
uh, that shows up there, you can save to follow up. And by the way, that's where you make the money is in the follow up. Uh, so we highly encourage you to do that, to uh, put your information in that chat, uh, share who you are, what you're looking for, what you're doing here, uh, where we can all help and where people can find you. Uh, do that in the chat room and, uh, and people will be able to follow up with you later. For tonight, uh, we always encourage you, if you are willing, to turn on those cameras. Uh, maybe not the microphones just yet. If you've got a cat uh, meowing in the background, maybe keep the mic off unless you've got a question. But if you have a question, ask it. Uh, this is not a presentation per se, right? This is a conversation. We're not here to guru you into stuff. Um, we'll tell you about some things that we're doing. And of course, we want to do a deal with you. Uh, but we really would prefer this to just be more of a conversation uh, about your business. And we'll tell you what we do for our business. And hopefully you can get something out of it. I know we always do. We, we get as much from our members as, uh, as I think they get from us. So please do consider this a back and forth. And at any point, if you have a question, raise your hand, say what's up, turn, off, turn on your microphone and, and ask your question, or at least uh, put it in that chat window. And we will all keep an eye. Uh, on those chat windows uh, and try to check them and see uh, if you've got any questions, we will try. I love how Danielle Answer. put the, the, Ga, the Gaza group. Who? <laughs> Danielle. She's Danielle with the Gaza group. Yeah. I, yeah, sorry, I was typing quick. <laughs> the Gaza group is our new uh, affiliate. It's our new affiliate. They're in a garbanzo bean. Anyway, so- The email's correct though. Go with the email. <laughs> Turn on those, uh, turn on those cameras uh, if you want. And now, since uh, it's still a reasonable room size, uh, if you are willing, uh, say hello. Tell us a little bit about yourself, what you're doing here tonight, what you do in real estate, what you want to do in real estate. If there's anything in particular you're looking to get out of this uh, chat this evening, uh, now would be your time to to say so. And if you don't mind, I usually kind of run through, and if I can see your face, I may even chat you up and say, hey, but since I don't see your face, but you show up at the top of my list, I'm going to say hey to Jad, because I know you were here. I saw you a minute ago. Jad, say hello. Hey, buddy. What's up? What's happening, man? How are you? I'm really excited about this Saturday, the big uh, the big event. Going to be cool. Going to be a good yeah. time. And I'm excited. Are you going to be there? Are you going to be presenting? We will be there in virtual spirit uh, this Saturday, but yep. Uh, I'll be there. Rob will be there. If I can pull it up on the screen, I'll show you who else is going to be there. Uh, I'm also excited about the topic tonight about uh, cost overages. Uh, my, my rehabbers are the construction people I've hired. They start off with an 80,000 budget and it ends up being 125. Uh, and hopefully you can teach us how to keep that, you know, in check and how to do an itemized list on the material. I mean, I just, I haven't had one contractor yet. I'm doing 12 projects where they said, Jad, we finished within budget. I mean, it's just crazy. Well, that's not the point, Jed. That's not how we make money. We come in. With <laughs> uh, we can talk about it. We'll, uh, we'll see if there's some strategies there. But yeah, good to see you, man. Uh, uh, next up on my list is Chip. I see you there. Hey. Five. Say what's up. How are you? Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. How are you? I'm doing good. I am in the private lending space, do a bunch of different kinds of uh, private loans all throughout the region and the country. Um, I am going to join for as long as I can on Saturday. So those that are uh, that are tuning in tonight will be sort of amused to know that I am freezing because it's technically football season and we are not in Green Bay out here, guys. So the high school football season, they're playing from February 1st to like April 1st. So we, we have a high school game on Saturday afternoon, and I was out last night on a freshman game, and it is cold out there. That is too much. Uh, that is uh, – that you're a diehard, but I'm guessing you're doing it for the youngsters. Uh, yeah, I got kids that are out there running around, so I, I can't sit at home toasty warm and say how to go. Got it. <laughs> got it. Cool. Well, thanks for being here tonight, and, uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll see you there on uh, Saturday as well. Can everybody see my screen, by the way, with the uh, Grid Connect 2021 here on the on the old screen? So if you go to uh, gridinvestor.com backslash Grid Connect 2021, if somebody, maybe Rob or Daniel wants to toss that in the chat box, uh, you will see that information for this Saturday. It is going to be awesome. I'll talk about it again a little bit at the end. 
uh, but a, uh, a tremendous amount of value and information will be shared uh, at that event on Saturday for a whopping $3. Uh, highly recommend you check it out. Uh, but I also see another face here. Uh, George, would you like to say hello? You can also hit your space bar. Unmute. How's everyone? Hello. I'm uh, studying to get into real estate uh, with a Casa Group. Um, and uh, we'll see once I get my license uh, where this takes me. Uh -huh. It takes awesome. us. It can, it can take you as far yeah. as you want to go. There's a wide, wide world in real estate. Uh, well, uh, good to see you. Thanks for coming out. I think I see another yeah. face I recognize. Janae, is that you? Coming in hot from the south. Uh, Janae Noble, yes, a grid chapter leader here in Athens, Georgia. Just retired here from Southern California. A longtime investor, started in the 70s. And uh, I'm very excited about tonight's meeting because I have a listing that um, is getting ready to go on the market, but he hasn't sold the property since the 70s. And uh, it might be good to do an addition on this property and then sell it. So I wanted to get... Uh, your uh, feedback on that at some point, if not tonight, no, during no, the no addition, no <laughs> permits, all kinds of stuff can be. Oh no, tell her, Mark. Well, no, what, just as you, is, where is. You're gonna need permits for a few different things, uh, but we can get into that. We'll we'll chat about what stuff costs and what you have to permit and maybe some of that stuff. Uh, well, good to see you, uh, Janae. Uh, Thank you. Good to be here. Sure, we will see you in Athens uh, here in the next few days coming up. You got a event coming up yourself. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm always at the end of the month so I can follow you guys. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's it's been a great experience, and I'm meeting a lot of really interesting people, including Jad. Who, Jad, you don't know our market. You don't know what you're talking about. But come down here and see it. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I know permits. Trust me. Hey, oh, yeah. you're you're a big baby. Southern California permits are nothing compared to permits out here. This is a joke. You are not kidding. Yeah, uh, Cal everything California is. Everything. Is right, everything. so don't cry. Don't cry. Uh, how about Jeffrey? Uh, I see you there. Would you like to say hello? Sure. Uh, Jeff Mitchell. I'm out of northern New Jersey, uh, but I like the topic. That's why I joined tonight. Cool. Uh, awesome. actually joined a couple other groups, but uh, interested. I have a multifamily that I have in northern Jersey that I'm doing a full renovation on. And uh, so I'm just looking to network, looking uh, to get more information on Burr and, you know, figuring out like uh, next time how I can do a better job of uh, figuring out what my budget should be. Love it. Buy, renovate, rent. Repeat. repeat refinance, repeat. Yeah. Uh, many, many good R's in that one. Uh, awesome. Well, thanks for coming on. Good to see you. Yeah, uh, if you buy anything in New York, let me know. I'm still licensed there too, and that's where I cut my teeth in real estate. And mostly, I'm I'm focused mostly in Jersey, and mm -hmm. then uh, and plus I'm, I'm like with this house, I'm learning the all the things because I became a GC, so I could actually manage it since it's a multifamily. If it was a single family, I wouldn't have to you know do that. But uh, so I've learned a whole bunch of stuff already. Uh, but always looking to figure out if there's something I'm missing. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Well, welcome. This is a good topic then. That's right. Good to see you. Uh, Mr. Patel, you Penn Patel, would you like to say hello? You can hit the I figured, I figured, figured out how to unmute myself. Yes. That, that's, that's step one, right? That's right. <laughs> All right. Hey, guys. Uh, so, U Penn Patel here. I'm in the Northern Virginia area. I'm joining from the perspective of, perspective of kind of learning about investments and whatnot. I do it on the other side, I'm a lender. So I specialize in working with investors. I've been doing it for eh, about five years now uh, on the lending side, working with investors all over the country. Uh, so I figured, you know, now I need to learn the craft of finding and doing the, you know, building my portfolio. Right? I gotta do it for others. Now I gotta try to learn the other side of the business so I can do it for myself. Cool. Well, you definitely have uh, the right skill set for it. If you already understand how the numbers work, that's uh, that's a big yeah. And I know that stuff, but the, <laughs> finding it is the other other skill set. So you know, obviously, you need to kind of have both sides of the coin. That's right. Well, you actually uh, are coming at it from the opposite direction that we talk about it. Uh, 
We actually start the year talking about finding deals and estimating construction and doing your rehab, and managing your rentals and all that. We kind of end the year talking about lending and how to actually become a private lender um, because we really feel like that's what the life cycle of an active investor could be. Take some of the money that you make from real estate, lend it to other people and make money on your money. Uh, not a bad way to go either. So I uh, look forward right. to maybe hopefully seeing you when we get around to that discussion. Yeah, uh, I'll be around to learn all the way along. Awesome. Well, good to see you here tonight. Uh, how about Dan? I see you uh, out there. Would you like to say hello? Yeah, I'm Dan Rieke, and I'm a real estate broker down in uh, Manassas uh, with Remax Gateway. I've uh, been to a number of your uh, sessions before in the past few years. We had a property management company, and it was a great business model, uh, but I sold it to my partner, and back in... Uh, the uh, the real estate market got a lot a lot of experience in, in dealing with investors and management and that and I'm just back here to get reacquainted with you all and find out where what's happening in the market and you just all you have to do is be around people and deals happen so I decided it's time to come back with you guys and check in awesome cool. I agree with that. You got to be around people. Deals happen. In fact, Chip and I, I referred Chip a deal the other day. It looks like that might come through. And that was just because Chip's been consistent. He's been coming, right? So he's who came to mind. That's how it works. That's right. Absolutely. That is how the network works. Uh, I see one other. Uh, Edric, I see your camera. Would you like to say hello? Hey everyone! Yeah, my my name is Cedric San Miguel. I um, I'm actually here uh, with with my partner Christine. She's also uh, in the class. Um, we're we're actually partnering up to start a, uh, a an LLC and get into the real estate business with Burr and uh, buy and flip. So I'm really interested to uh, see how how we can learn from this uh, from this session. I I actually work as a general contractor, but more on the a commercial side so looking to learn on, on the residential side of things cool well uh then as a contractor we definitely uh, would look to hear your thoughts on things and some of what we discuss and numbers and process and all that and uh and get your take on it so i'm glad to have you here for that awesome. uh, and anyone else that wants to say hello Feel free, unmute yourself. If you hold down your space bar uh, on most computers, that will unmute your microphone and you can say hello. Or you can also say hello in the old chat box. Just throw in your contact information there if you want. Uh, if you have a question, toss it there. Uh, or again, jump in uh, when you have a question or a thought. Uh, and with that, I'll keep motoring unless anybody else wants to say hello. I'll say hi really quick. My yeah. name is Christine and I am uh, the business partner with Edric. So just wanted to pop in today and I don't want to repeat whatever he said. So I'm just really open to learning and we just created our LLC. So we're really excited um, and we have the momentum and ready to learn anything that we can. He said you were in charge. So <laughs> he's ready for that. Okay, Where do fine. you guys do your investing? <laughs> She's the CPA, so she she's in charge. <laughs> cool. What part of the world are you in? Sorry, I can hear you say I that. Say, what part of the world are you in? Uh, I we live in uh, Virginia, so I'm in Springfield. Edric's in Centerville. Cool. All right. All right. Yeah, and we uh, both went to UVA, so we've been here um, most of our lives, and really love the area. As a terp, that somewhat hurts my heart, but that's all right. We're not in the same <laughs> conference anymore, so I'll let bygones be bygones. Uh, speaking of letting bygones be bygones, uh, important uh, technical legal stuff. It's all uh, shenanigans. Don't pay attention to any of it. Um, or you can pay attention to it uh, because it works for me, but just know everybody here uh, is not an attorney or an accountant. You're not getting any kind of specific advice on stuff. It's just what we do, right? So always bet everything that anyone tells you anywhere and anyone you ever meet and any deal anyone ever offers you, uh, do your homework uh, and play it safe out there. Uh, but what we will talk about are the things that we do and the experience that we've had and the money that we spend and the deals that we've done, like what you see on your screen, 
And so what we're talking about here uh, tonight are estimating renovations. So kind of pepper this discussion with some looks uh, before and afters of uh, some renovations that we've done. So you kind of get a sense for kind of what we're doing. And uh, I don't know, uh, Danielle, you can kind of speak to as whether or not you see anything like, I don't know, here, bathrooms. What, what How we, much was your landscaping on that, Mr. Beckett? What we get is what you see on the right and what we hope to land on is what you see on the left. The landscaping on this beautiful thing that you're looking at here was a deal we did in Annandale a couple of years ago. Uh, not much, not enough, to be honest with you. Uh, probably a couple grand worth of mulch and tiny shrubs. You'll see when I get to the back. And how much was it to build up that thing on top of the door? Yeah, that little doodad on top of the, the porch there is a little overhang. I just wanted to break up the front of this house it's really flat, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I didn't like the two-tone uh, brick and, and yellow siding, so we replaced the siding and then painted the brick. So to kind of break up the big gray monolith, I stuck that thing on the front. And that is probably about uh, eight, nine hundred dollars worth of material between the little supporty brackets there, right? And then the framing uh, to actually get it attached to the front of the house. Those are cedar shake looking shingles on the front, right? Just vinyl siding, but it's meant to look like cedar. So it's a little bit fancier than that. And that one has a... I think actually that one might be a, a standing seam metal roof, in which case it would be more than seven, eight hundred dollars. That wouldn't cover the roof. But for shingles for like eight, eight ish hundred dollars, that's probably the material cost. And then that's probably another twelve hundred dollars in labor costs at cost. Right. So I had about two grand in it. Um, your GC <laughs> might charge you twenty five, twenty seven somewhere in that range, maybe. So, so you painted like you painted the brick white, you yep. painted the shutters black. Yep. And then you replaced the siding right, yep. on the front of the house. Yep. There's a single and, family detached property. Uh, and then you, and you, and you added the storm door there, or is that the same one? Uh, that's the, that is a new front door. Yeah. So you wow. can see, put in a glass front door with side lights on it, uh, which, I do. Anytime we've got a door that's big enough to accommodate, you know, side lights of glass, I uh, try to uh, put as much glass in the front as you can. Some people don't like it uh, because it's a privacy thing, uh, but you can get doors that have the shades built in or you can put a shade on the other side or you can do whatever you want when it's yours. But when we're selling, I try to introduce light anywhere you can in the house. So uh, wow. front doors are a big curb appeal thing. First thing you see just about when you walk up to the house. And I try to let as much light in as you can. But this house is uh, maybe about average for us. And it is certainly going to be average for the kind of numbers we're talking about, for the kind of curb appeal you can do at the, the kind of numbers that we're talking. Uh, your mileage will vary like everything else in this discussion. Uh, but if you need to do more landscaping than just cleaning up the yards, mowing the grass, pulling out the weeds, taking down anything that's climbing up the side of the house, and replacing it with a couple green things and some mulch, you will need to budget appropriately for that. Like I said, we get to the back, I think I've got some photos of okay, cool. uh, some of the work we did on the back with like a deck and that kind of thing. And, hey Mark, uh, did you just uh, blast the, uh, uh, the walkway? Uh, yes, this walkway was just cleaned. It was not replaced, it was not poured new. It's amazing what you can do with a pressure washer and some silver. Yeah, it looks so, nice. Uh, in fact, it's kind of hard to see it with this photo, but it's a it was a brick stoop in the front. We just painted the brick stoop gray. Yeah, see uh, you can get a lot done with paint and a pressure washer. Uh, but yeah, I'd say uh, this is pretty typical for us. So on the outside uh, of our stuff, we try to increase curb appeal as much as we can without going to dramatic lengths. Maybe the next time we have this discussion, I can have some photos of, uh, of another project that we're working on in Vienna. Where we're adding a few more uh, kind of exterior bits to dress up uh, a split level house that I also don't really like the look of. So I'm trying to kind of get the front to have a little more architectural interest. Um, we can uh, chat about that when I've got something to show, but typically we're not doing that. Typically, this is about the fanciest thing we'll put on the front of the house. We're mostly just painting. These are not 
uh, major uh, exterior additions and remodels that we're doing in most cases. So when we get to uh, discussions about money, I'll talk about kind of renovation money. If we want to talk about expansion and addition money, we can do that. Yeah, because it's it's about speed. And right now in this market, let's be honest, like the market is insane, right? You want to try to get that property on the market as fast as you possibly can. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of people even debating the market is, is moving so fast, yeah. debating as to whether they should do a full reno, right? It's like you buy it, you clean it, and then just put it right back up on the market and as is condition. But you always, the market always tells you what to do. So, and um, to go ahead, your Rob. point, Rob, uh, you should be making your money when you buy the house, right? That's right. Uh, That's any right. deal that we've bought is a deal that we could have wholesaled to someone else and made money that way. Perfectly legitimate, acceptable, and wonderful way uh, to make money. You can make a ton of money. You can make way more money uh, just wholesaling than you can buying and investing and taking on the risk and the hassle and, uh, and everything else that you do by renovating. Uh, and the intermediate step then is what Rob was saying. You don't necessarily even sell the contract. You close on the house, but just literally clean it up if the house is dirty. Fix any giant holes in the thing. Get it to kind of weekend warrior condition, if that. And then you can put it on the open market uh, and sell it on the open market without a lot of work. Uh, the point of this discussion is how to estimate an actual renovation if you're going to do it. But to Rob's point, know what market you're in and, and what work you have to do. And generally speaking, you should only do the work that you have to do to maximize your return. So I typically wouldn't renovate the house uh, if I didn't need to any more than I need to to get it sold uh, and get back you know, at least what I spent on it and hopefully more. Uh, but yeah, that will depend on the market that you're in, the neighborhood you're in, the competition you've got. Uh, it depends on a few factors that you'll need to kind of know in addition to just what it's going to cost to fix it up. So I don't know, Danielle, uh, does this look pretty typical for what you see in, uh, I'll say, as is houses on the right, but more importantly, in renovated houses on the left. Is this a typical renovated bathroom here in our market? Yes, for sure. And while, and Mark, I know you could speak a little bit more to this, while it might look pretty fancy, right? It's got a glass shower door, it's got very nice looking tile, it's got a very clean look. A lot of this can actually be um, slightly above builder grade finishes, if you will. It's kind of the new style, but it, it style does not have to be expensive. Um, and we're going to go into more detail about exactly what kind of finishes and things you should pick, especially based on price point and what's going to make you the most money uh, and return on your investment. But think, keeping things pretty classic um, in terms of design style, finishes, things like that really bodes well long term and also sells the most to the most buyers. So yeah. what's on the left is kind of that classic, classic reno. Yeah. So, but there's a new style though, Danielle, where I've seen contractors where they're just doing like a prefab shower. So there's no tile work. They're just putting like the whole shower in to the thing. I mean, it looks nice, it looks slick, but there's no tile work to try to cut down on yeah. the cost. Uh, Mr. And Beckett, how much would something like this that. cost? Yeah. So well, how much would a bathroom like this cost you? To, to both of your points, talking about you know, builder grade and what builders do, I'd say this is, uh, probably builder grade. Um, in some ways, spec builder stuff is nicer. People are expecting uh, some variety in the, the look of things and tile, not just the plainest white tile everywhere, right? Um, but to Jad's point, builders are also, I don't want to say downgrading, but they're taking of advantage, they're taking advantage of the fact that there are new materials that are less expensive and not your traditional, authentic, high-end materials that look 95% as good and you get away with it, especially in this market. So, for instance, flooring. There are new builders now who are using the luxury vinyl tile flooring, luxury vinyl plank flooring in the main spaces, in the living rooms and kitchens of their million-dollar houses in this market, uh, where before you would expect it to be hardwood or tile, right? Uh, they, they are using the luxury vinyl product because it's a better product. It is not the cheap laminate uh, that 
we used to have, and that was the predominant non-real wood product you know, five, 10 years ago, uh, the products have gotten better. So that's another thing that is part of your job as a rehabber is to kind of keep up with what's happening, keep up with trends, keep up with building materials, keep up with what's new, and that will hopefully save you money or get you a product that is cheaper, faster, or better than what you did last time, right? So uh, Jad, to get back to your point on the bathroom, I would say you're looking at probably a $4,000-ish dollar uh, cost, labor and material, assuming everything was there. In this particular house, while that bathroom was there, as you see it on the right, uh, we had to, because it was in such terrible condition, replace a lot of the uh, water supply and drain lines behind the wall. So you don't get to see that, uh, but we had to deal with it when we demoed that bathroom and saw that the drain stack was old and rusty and the water supplies were all bad and leaky. So there were probably another 1,502 grand worth of jacking up floors to get new drains in and installing new water lines over to this side of the house to serve this space. And some of that I kind of cover in um, my estimates. Some of that you, you just try to find out as best you can what's going on in the house. Um, this will be another pitch for some things that we'll have coming soon. Uh, in some of these projects I have now, we're uh, trying to uh, kind of follow the renovation process and walk through and look at what we look at when we're in the house. How we try to figure out what might be wrong with it. How we try to figure out what the seller's not telling us and what we need to, to know and what tires we need to kick and what holes we need to cut to get information on the house before we buy it. And then you can see it when the walls are off so you can see what we actually found uh, and have some of that fun. But hopefully you get lucky and everything is where you need it. All the plumbing works. You're just replacing the stuff that you see. And for a bathroom like that, just replacing the tile and a new toilet and a vanity and a sink and a faucet and a mirror and a light and all that, four to five grand for good material. Um, and that even includes a relatively inexpensive door. I think that actually was a custom door, which was probably like $900, but you can now get uh, good door kits at Depot and Lowe's for like five, 600 bucks that look yeah. every bit as good as that. And that's- Is, what is that labor included, uh, Mr. Beckett? I'm sorry? Is that labor included in that no. price of 5,000? Uh, yes, 5,000, yes. 500 for the door, no. Uh, so those frameless glass doors are obviously a really good look, right? I hate doing tile work in a bathroom and then covering up with a shower curtain so that you can't see our cool tile and our <laughs> neat niches and all that. So I yeah. really like the glass doors. They're really sexy uh, yeah. and they show well. Uh, and you can now get them for almost half uh, of the cost of a fully custom uh, door that's been cut to size uh, with the, the door kits. So that is one place that, uh, take it from me, you can save a couple bucks and still get 99% you know, of the look. Uh, yeah. but that's the look. Look, we go for in a bath. Yeah, and Jad, you had mentioned, I know what product you're talking about. It's kind of like... Um, it yeah it's it's like a like a a sleeve if you will like almost like a, a shower sleeve like a pre-installed right. yeah. pre-fabricated shower i've even seen that have kind of like subway tile built in to the design of the pre-fabricated sleeve what i've seen a lot of people do is actually grout that like it'll have grout lines built in that you can fill with real grout after you say paint or glaze that product it can look really, really nice. I've actually seen um, several examples of them in person and also like videos on how they've been installed before. I would say that quality of product is very applicable in the right place at the right time. Now, depending- I think, on Danielle, I think like I have a contractor that just did this to me and yeah. I paid him like 110 grand. And when I saw it, I was like, where's the tile work? He goes, well, you didn't specify. So I just got this pre-thing shower that he just stuck into a home that I'm gonna be listing for $650,000. Like I, and so- 650 and <laughs> I gotta say for the link, it's crazy. So Where like on this call, like please, if you guys get a bid from your contractor, specify whether it's gonna be tile or a prefabbed plastic shower that just slides in like Danielle's talking about. Yeah. I've That's a different issue, Jed, but that is definitely a scope and spec issue with your contractor, right? Sure. Uh, 
you definitely want to work those things out uh, while you're working out your scope and your cost with your contractor. Uh, yeah. Because, yeah, I'd be bent, too, if I thought I was going to get tile and I got a cheap ass plastic shower insert. They're not all cheap. So uh, to yeah. Thomas's point, uh, and I think Mike is maybe saying the same thing, like the bath fitter uh, kind of cheap white plastic deal. Yes, it's like that. And you can get that. But you can also get much nicer looking uh, overlay type material. I, I looked at one just the other day and I can't remember the name of the, the website. Uh, but the reason I didn't jot it down uh, is because they are still more expensive than what I would spend just going to floor and decor and getting a decent inexpensive tile and having a tile guy install it. The good installs, uh, the full complete like shower and bath kits are still a little expensive. They're sexy looking. They look really cool. They look like stone and they'll have like the built-in tray on the bottom with the cool long drain and, and they're really nice, but you're going to pay several thousand dollars for that insert that I can get the tile done for, for that or less. So yeah. we're getting there. Like and they wanted to save on the actual time they spent on installing it, Jed. That's, that is where you say, that's right. And where I've seen them used a lot is in uh, hotels and condos and apartments. When you're knocking out you know, a floor of a dozen or two of these bathrooms in a few days, that is when it probably gets economical to have somebody doing it, bam, bam, same thing every day. Uh, with what we do on the rehab side, I never get the same house twice, right? The measurement is never exactly the same. All the walls are always not quite square and not quite plumb, and you're always having to shim and mess around and do stuff. And if you're messing around and doing stuff and fixing pipes and doing other things, you don't get the savings of having a guy you know, walk in with 10 of these things and knock out 10 of your bathrooms in 72 hours. Uh, that's where you can afford to pay more for a really nice insert kit that you can kind of pop in a few at a time. I haven't found it to be uh, cost effective for me yet, but I think we're getting there. Uh, oh, one of my favorite people, Teresa, chimed in saying they've got some new higher end looking stuff uh, out of Kohler. Uh, and it wouldn't surprise me. Kohler makes all kinds of cool things. Ooh. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised also if pretty soon now uh, things like shower and bath kits get to a point where for the same cost or less than tile, you can get something that looks as good and is also faster. So when that happens, I'll start doing it. I'll let you know as soon as I find it. Anybody else sees one that they like, let us know. Uh, yeah, let's take sure. it. So uh, another bathroom uh, here. Uh, what I would point out is what I do. Uh, if you look at the vanity there on the left, this isn't a very large bathroom, but we took it from a two-piece, essentially powder room, and turned it into a shower. Uh, that is covered in one of the costs that I will use tonight uh, to, when the space allows, open up a wall. I think we got lucky in this one that it was on a hallway and there was a closet on the other side of that wall that I could harvest for a shower. Uh, it depends on where plumbing is and how much work you're gonna have to do to get it there. But in some cases, in a lot of cases, maybe I'd even say in most cases, uh, if you can do something like this for another two grand even to you know, knock down the wall and put in the plumbing and, and frame and tile a shower, which you may well be able to do, that's worth doing. That, that adds more value than it costs you to do in a lot of cases. That's one thing to note there. Look at my vanity. Uh, we use spread faucets instead of kind of the one piece all in one. We do that. I say that looking at comps now, I see more and more professional renovators and builders uh, still using the one piece or going back to one piece cheap faucets. May work. I don't know. Uh, you just have to keep up with what's going on. Look at your comps, see what the guys are doing across the street from you. And you don't have to do any more than the last person did, hopefully, uh, if you are going to have a similar house at a similar price point. I got a question for you. Yeah. Do you, uh, are you worried about like, you know, doing a modern style or traditional style or minimal style? You know, like, like if you watch like HDTV, they're always like, oh, I'm going to do this bathroom because house is this way. And so I kind of like pick my materials this way. Yeah. Are you doing that? Or are you just picking like good materials that look like I've, I've seen like, you know, the shower door here? Right? Yeah. So hopefully you will see and hopefully agree as we go through these photos. 
we're a pretty middle of the road neutral style, right? I, I like a modern house. I, I would probably do things differently if it were my house. But if I were gonna say there's a rule number one to this, rule number one is don't do exactly what you want. Do what will be the most accepted by the market. Uh, so you'll need to make some choices. So you'll see we've got some tile choices here, kind of marbly looking tile. We used a mosaic tile for the shower floor and we put the floor tile in the bathroom at a 45 degree angle instead of plain square. But that's still not like radical, right? That's not a drastic style choice. We used a gray cabinet and a white countertop and a uh, brushed nickel hardware. Uh, we're not taking crazy uh, design uh, chances here. Uh, that's because most of our houses are in kind of middle market, middle price point. We'll try to push price where we can because the house is hopefully in better shape than most of its competition. But I'm not going to spend a quarter million dollars to try to get a quarter million more when I could spend a hundred thousand dollars and try to get 110 more. Uh, we definitely try to work hard not to over renovate uh, and to renovate to too particular of a style. Uh, so my style selections, my style theory uh, now runs more towards grays and whites as opposed to off whites and beige, right? We don't do cinnamon cabinets uh, now. We're not doing even espresso cabinets with the kind of giallo yellow granite tops, right? Uh, the style now is more towards white tops or black dark tops on white uh, cabinetry, uh, gray cabinetry. And if you wanna get really funky every once in a while, you'll see if we're doing a nicer house, like a blue island, right? Or a black island in the kitchen. Uh, black fixtures for some of the lights and in the bathroom. So the deal I'm doing now in Vienna, we're gonna have black bath fixtures in it uh, because that is on trend. I try not to be super on trend, right? Uh, I'm not gonna see any like faucets coming out of the wall into crazy vessel sinks or anything like that in any of our bathrooms. That is too taste specific for me. Uh, um, Mark or Mr. Becca, can you tell us like overall while you're going through this, what was your planning on, what was the price point you were trying to get? So maybe we can get like a big picture because I think that will help us understand why you did the renovations that you did. Yeah, like, so in overall? Northern Virginia, th this is a single family house in Northern Virginia that sold for uh, a little over 700,000. You know, it was a year ago, uh, I think, for these photos. And uh, how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms? I think that was a four, three. Four, three, got it. Uh, by the time we got done with it. So pretty, pretty traditional middle of the road house here in Northern Virginia. So these are was this bathroom was this as well. Or? Yep. I'd say I, I, we probably had about, about four, 4,500 in this bathroom. Now, and, and Mark, just to make sure it's clear, was that your cost? That is my cost. Uh, not correct. As, Sorry, not that as is. you as a consumer, Jad, would be paying your contract. That's right. So, Jad, if you hired me to do that, I would probably charge you like 7000 uh, I had to worth take, every penny of it, Mark. I had to take down a wall. Really? Uh, and uh, And put that, put that shower in. Uh, but that's okay. When I get to talking actual prices here for estimate purposes, that will be... Uh, at retail numbers, and I'll kind of explain the, the housing wise of that. So looking at a kitchen, uh, this gets to my point, a lot oh, of white. Before we move on, uh, Janae yeah. had actually raised her hand really quick. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, just real quick on the uh, bathroom uh, down by the, uh, on the before and after down by the toilet was the little vent. It looked like that's where the uh, air conditioning came in and then yeah. you expanded the um, cabinet. So I wondered how you rerouted the uh, air conditioning. I see a vent up in the ceiling, but I think that's an exhaust. That's right? the fan. And so this one, I think. Oh, it's in the ceiling now. Mm, mm. See down there by the toilet and then how the- I do, yeah. I do. Oh. So for that particular house, One of two things is possible, Janae, and I can't quite remember. It is possibly now a vertical 
vent in the exact same location. It's just kind of hidden around the corner of that cabinet and tucked tight to the cabinet. Uh, your bathroom must have a vent, by the way. You can't just make it go away. Or trying to remember back, we might have put that one in the floor because it came under the floor in this bathroom. And that's actually pretty straightforward and easy to do and allowable. It might not be great in a bathroom to have a vent in the floor when you're stepping out of the shower that gets water and stuff and hair down into it. But if that let me put in a larger vanity for the sake of moving that vent either to the wall opposite, if it came in in the floor or through the floor in that particular bathroom, I might have done it uh, to get the larger vanity. And I believe that is because this was a uh, master bathroom, believe it or not. This bathroom originally only had the two piece and we wanted a full sized uh, or not a full, we ended a full master bath and in a master you can't have enough storage right so i wanted to maximize storage so well done it's a beautiful before and after thank you but, yeah if i had to guess uh Janelle, i would i would say that we moved that vent uh into the floor uh but that was because we had demoed the floor anyway right we were going to be putting tile on the floor and if we were able to identify that the vent ran under the floor there you just cut a hole you cap it off in the wall cut a new hole into the duct underneath put your register there and connected to the floor and that that costs dozens of dollars not even hundreds of dollars to cut into that vent if it's there already and you know where it is right so but that's good good eye and that definitely i think was a change at least uh, a little bit uh, so here in a kitchen uh you will see again a lot of gray a lot of white uh things uh Sort of, uh, well, I think a lot of stuff got moved in this one in particular, but in most cases, we try to leave plumbing where it is and only when we can achieve something better, much better in a design, do we attempt to move uh, plumbing and electric, right? Uh, this kitchen, actually, you'll get a much better sense of it. With the next photo, this is the opposite end of that same kitchen. Uh, down below, you can see this house had a big, enormous fireplace in the middle of the room uh, where the kitchen stepped down to this kind of dining room, I guess, on one side of the fireplace monstrosity. And then you had a living room on the other side of it. Uh, the whole thing just choked the room off uh, and the kitchen was too small. So what we did in this house was actually extend the kitchen into that kind of lower little built in -y looking area there. Uh, raised the floor up so it was all the same height. And then you then step down uh, a little bit farther back. If you look at the top, you can see the steps that now go down. Uh, the living room was still sunken. We just moved the sunken part back into the room so we could uh, widen the kitchen. Uh, probably not gonna go wrong spending your money in the kitchen and bathroom, right? Uh, they are the most expensive rooms in the house. They are the most impressive rooms in the house. They have the most shiny stuff. So they deserve the most attention. Uh, and they also happen to be where people spend most of their time, other than in front of the TV, that'll probably be in and out of the bathroom and in and out of the kitchen. Uh, so they deserve the most like trash disposal on that, or like, are we talking just basic sink, dishwasher, refrigerator? Uh, so this particular house was just the regular appliance package, except what you don't see is the microwave. I don't know if I've got a shot of it, uh, but the microwave is uh, a below counter install. Uh, and that's actually as fancy as a regular old plug-in countertop microwave, but you get a trim kit for it. You buy the special cabinet that it'll fit in, buy the trim kit to go around the outside, mount it uh, underneath your countertop, and it looks all slick and built in uh, for you know another hundred bucks more than a regular uh, countertop microwave. And then our other uh, kind of extra fancy doodad, if you look the top left corner, top left square to the right hand side, you'll kind of see a wine rack kind of thing going on in one of those bumped out cabinets. Um, in the photo to the right of that, you'll see a mini fridge uh, below that wine rack and those cabinets uh, were held off the wall another two inches uh, to kind of make that beverage center, if you want to call it that, uh, kind of a highlight of that cabinet run. 
Uh, and that just costs a couple bucks, a couple of extra two by fours to bump cabinets off the wall, a couple pieces of trim. Uh, so fluted filler or special filler that you have to use on the side to kind of cover where it bumps out, make sure it fits in your cabinet run. And that's a cheap way to get a little extra fancy uh, in your kitchen uh, if you've got the space for it and if it makes sense to do. So we had a lot of real estate in this kitchen and we were kind of going for broke on the kitchen. So we added those kind of nice uh, doodads in the kitchen area. Yeah, Mark, uh, we had a question about the where the skylights went. Yeah, the skylights went away because uh, they were leaking. Uh, I do generally like skylights, uh, but in the case of this one, it just sky, uh, the skylight that we had was bad. So it was going to have to be replaced. I think a skylight, if you get the cheapest non-opening skylight is still, I don't know, 600-ish dollars in this size and like a two by four size. And that's just for the park. Then you have to flash it. Your roofer's got to go around it. Uh, in this particular case, it was not worth, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. Uh, it was going to be cheaper. We did have to do the roof anyway. So while we were doing the roof anyway, I just covered it up. Uh, so yeah, I, I put it, I've put skylights in intentionally where they were needed when it was a darker space. This space just already had plenty of light and I didn't need the trouble. So covered it Mr. up. Beckett, what about the fireplace? You weren't worried that when you moved it, it wasn't a bearing, it wasn't going to affect the, in, uh, the structural integrity? Correct. The yep. So I know that from looking at it and from kind of being in the house and see, seeing how the ceiling ran and how the joists likely were built. Uh, but if you were concerned about something like that, and in this kitchen, I think we did open up some walls, uh, you have the engineer come in and for 400-ish dollars, give or take, depending on what all he's got to look at that day, you can get your engineer to come out. And then depending on what you need, you can either get the verbal, yep, you're fine with that. Don't worry about it. Take it out of the way, move it, add it, whatever. Or if he says, well, if you need it to be on your plan that this was done properly or you need to move a thing or a load needs to move, then I will write it up and stamp it for you. Double that 400 at least, usually per thing that he's got to kind of do the math on and design and stamp. Uh, and he or she will uh, get you that plan if you need it in your design that you would follow to do a structural thing. Uh, but that one was not a structural fireplace. It just poked up through the roof and you can see it in the little tiny attic area uh, that wasn't holding anything up. It was just a giant fireplace. So I like fireplaces. That one was way too big. Uh, yeah, it was right in the middle. Choke, um, choke we, have other, we have two other questions that yep. kind of well, a couple of several other questions that get into the specifics of the kitchen. Um, how much did it cost to relocate the sink? Uh, did you have to tear up the slab for the drain relocation or how much did the, how much to add duct work to the hood also for the exhaust cost? Okay. So I Gonna, guess the specifics there. Yep, in, in the case of this particular house, uh, this was a, uh, it had a little bit of everything. It was predominantly what I would call a, just a two level rambler. Uh, kitchen bedrooms on the upper floor, a bedroom, bathroom, library, den kind of thing, and some storage in the basement underneath. Uh, and it also had a little bit of crawl space in that area where the kitchen extended. So at some point, someone else had added an addition onto that house. And when they put the addition on, there was like a little bit of a crawl space kind of thing left over and then the slab underneath the rest of that addition. So that will impact what it costs you to do some of the systems work, plumbing, electric, HVAC, all of these things are gonna be hidden in walls, under floors, in attics, in chases, uh, between floors. A chase is kind of the hole that goes between one floor to another, right? So you've gotta get these things between floors and usually hidden. So the more open, empty, otherwise unused area you've got to work in, the cheaper it's gonna be. Uh, in a already finished space or worst case scenario in the concrete of the basement. If you're moving drains and things around, yep, you sometimes do have to jack up concrete and that will be the most expensive thing uh, that you'll have to do for moving uh, one of your systems around. The best thing is an unfinished basement where you can kind of run stuff anywhere you want with an unfinished attic above or you can run all the electrical you want um, without having to rip much out. Uh, but you just have to know what you're looking at 
uh, to account for whether it's going to be an easy job or a hard job to move things around, uh, which kind of gets me to some general points. So we could talk about specific costs of things and the specific costs I would give you for a thing for this house will be highly accurate because I, I know what I spent on this particular house. But the point of this exercise is not to come up with a to the penny uh, proposal or bid that a contractor would use to tell me how much it's gonna cost to renovate this house. It's something that I can use uh, when I'm considering a house to make an offer on so that I know how much to offer on the house and how much I think it's going to sell for and how much it's going to cost me to fix it up, right? And in this case, the me would be an investor uh, who would be hiring another contractor or contractors to do the work for me. Uh, so let me preface, talk about numbers and cost per square foot uh, with the caveat that, that the purpose of this discussion tonight for me is efficiency. I don't want to drive to every single house. I'm certainly not going to ask my contractor to go to every single house. Someone actually, I think, asked about that a little bit earlier. They, well, how do I get contractors to uh, go to all my jobs and, and give me these estimates? They'll do it once or twice. But if you take a contractor to three or four of your houses and then you don't get them because you're just trying to find out how much you want to pay for the house, they'll stop picking up the phone, right? So you don't want to abuse your contractor, nor do you want to waste your own time. Uh, we need to be able to make offers on houses without going to them every single time and spending hours and hours trying to come up with a full estimate. So we, based on our experience, try to come up with shortcuts uh, for what we would call a typical house or a typical deal. And the good news, doing it the way I do it, is typically we renovate a lot of the stuff that you see. In most of the houses that we do, we will fully renovate the bathroom. We'll fully, what I consider fully, renovate the kitchen. I will leave things where they are if I can, but I will assume, depending on what kind of house it is and, and what level of finish I expect to be doing, I'll assume that I'll have to move one or two things. And so you'll see that in a second when I start talking about costs uh, for uh, what I typically spend, uh, what I'm assuming I'm going to have to do to them. Uh, so in this particular kitchen that you were just looking at, yes, we moved a few things around. Uh, how much was the actual kitchen? That one, I would say a general contractor uh, would need to charge you for the kitchen bit. Jed, probably closer to 22 to 25 uh, because things got moved around, a wall got opened up, a whole floor got built uh, to go to the living room. And that doesn't include the cost of demo and removal of that fireplace. I'll call that a cost of the living room because it was technically in the living room. Demo's not expensive. The demo was like you know, a couple hundred dollars in dumpster space and, and a guy with a sledgehammer. Uh, but then you have to patch the hole and do a little paint and, and uh, flooring and that kind of thing. Um, but I would say that was about a, uh, I'll call it a $20,000 kitchen minus the appliances. So when I give you numbers in here, I have an appliance budget built into that. My typical appliance package for most of our deals here for houses that sell for five to 800,000, that's our typical appliance package is like three grand. Uh, we don't spend a lot. We're not getting the crazy, fancy TV in the door uh, refrigerator. I'm using the you know double French door. Maybe if we can find a deal on it that day, the kind of two doors in the top and the pull-out freezer on the bottom uh, type of refrigerator, and then just a matching, uh, in most cases, stainless steel dishwasher, plain old range, and, and microwave. Nothing really fancy for appliances uh, because we don't need to. But if you're doing a million dollar deal, maybe you need to upgrade your appliance package a little bit. If you're building a $2 million house, you might need the Sub-Zero, but we typically don't. So that's not going to be in my costs. My estimates don't assume I'm doing a Sub-Zero. But again, the point of all of this is to speed up my ability of looking at a deal, making an offer to a seller, uh, and getting a house under contract. And once I have the house under contract, then I can go back with a contractor, with a pen and pad, look at the, the actual 
uh, costs based on the house as it sits uh, and come up with a more formalized uh, estimate and scope for the work. Well, how do you do that? You've already got the house under contract, you may say. You don't even know exactly what it's going to cost to finish. Exactly. That's why we have kickouts in our contracts. And that's why we offer $100 deposits to our sellers. And that is why, most importantly, all of these deals that we're doing are with motivated sellers. No, this does not work for a house that you're going to find on Zillow that's going to have 50 other people bidding on it. They're going to get the highest and best offer they're going to get on the market anyway. This won't work for that. So please don't try it. Uh, these, these techniques work when you're dealing with motivated sellers, selling the kind of houses that we buy as is for cash quickly and solve somebody's problem. When you're solving somebody's problem, they'll let you give them a $100 deposit because they know you're going to get there in a couple of weeks or not. If not, I've wasted two weeks of your life and if I have to kick out later because I come to the house with my guy and find out you got a bad foundation, all the plumbing is trashed, I didn't know about the hole in the ceiling. First of all, we renegotiate. I've almost never lost a deal because people know if you did really get a good sense of what was in the house uh, because you saw their house posted for sale by owner on Craigslist and you threw them an offer and they took it. You show up at the house and it's got problems. They're probably expecting uh, something to get renegotiated. Motivated seller makes all of that stuff go away. And by the way, come back next month and we'll talk about how to negotiate with a motivated seller and what they sound like and the words to use and all that. Uh, but the, the most important thing to remember here uh, is we are helping people solve problems that they have with their real estate. And in doing that, it allows all kinds of different flexibility. Uh, so that's what this, this tool is. This is a tool to increase my flexibility and speed to making an offer and understanding. it. So what I do to do that is I use historical data and square footage. It's that simple. What did it cost me before to do this the last 10 times? How big was that house? How much then did I spend per square foot in the kitchen, in the bathroom, on the roof, on the whatever? Uh, and then I apply that to the next deal. Uh, so therefore, the more data points you have, the better. The more you've done this, the more accurate your numbers will be. You can use mine as a starting point uh, and hopefully they'll work for you. But you should uh, develop for yourself a good understanding of what you spend and what your contractor charges you uh, to do things. And of course, we're always looking for cheaper, faster, better. So hopefully you'll find uh, cheaper and faster and better contractors and cheaper and newer uh, material. Uh, but that will be part, again, of your job is to start building that database uh, of experience that you used and that you spent, and dollars that you spent, uh, so that your next deal will be more profitable and your next assumption will be more accurate. So more information, the better then, right? So what I want to start with then is as much information about the house as I can get. So if I'm talking directly to the seller, I'm asking them, uh, what condition is the house in? When was the last time things were renovated? How old is the roof? What condition are the appliances in? Usually again, if I'm talking to them, they're probably motivated. Neither I found them or they found me from some kind of motivated seller pitch. Uh, and I'm expecting the answers to be, yeah, not renovated, not great condition, because if it was just renovated last year, I said, okay, great. Well, why did you call me again? Uh, because chances are that's not my seller, right? Uh, but I ask anyway, all the information I can get on the condition, photos if you can get it, past listings. Uh, a lot of times uh, you will find uh, old listing information. Something's better than nothing. It can be photos of the inside of a house that you might uh, not otherwise have. You can get a lot from aerial photography. Google Street Maps can show you the outside of a lot of houses in most major metropolitan areas. Uh, tax records, and then of course, anyone with actual information, listing agents, sellers, whatever. Uh, just ask. You'd be surprised what you get by asking. Ask for all the information you can uh, until you seem like you're being a pest, and then ask about eight more questions, and then hopefully you'll get what you need uh, to be able to do, to do your estimate, right? So even without that additional information, I can tell you in my experience, because we typically renovate the bathrooms, the kitchen, we typically are gonna have to do all the paint and the trim and all of the flooring in something, carpet, hardwood, something. Uh, I'm gonna have to do a couple grand worth of something on the outside of every house, be it 
uh, some replacement shingles or new shingles or paint the house or fix a lead walk. Uh, the numbers that I use work for me so that having done this before, knowing about what the square footage is and about what I typically pay per square foot, I can come in within five, 10, 15 grand, depending on how big the overall budget is of actual average cost. Uh, and that's my goal here. My goal is not to come in to the penny with this level of estimating. Uh, hopefully you weren't coming uh, looking for uh, super secret ninja ways of estimating the cost of a house that you've never seen and never been in. Uh, you can't do that, right? You actually have to go and see the house to know exactly to the penny what it's gonna cost so that you can have exact to the inch measurements of your space. But within 10 grand, you know, on a $75,000, $85,000 average renovation, that's good enough for me uh, to make an offer. Because if I'm only 10 grand off, when I get to the house with what I see, I can still negotiate with that usually. I can still save my deal or I can take a lower, uh, a lower profit if it ends up being more. If it ends up being less, great, more money for me. And I'd say probably half the time, that's what happens. I try to be conservative. Uh, I try to approach these deals where uh, I try first not to lose money. And so if they make more money than I thought or hoped, great. Job number one, try not to lose money. Uh, so once again, please do not go out and buy uh, real estate sight unseen based solely on uh, my uh, random event information that I give you, right? People do it. Uh, there are plenty of people out there whose wholesaling business is based entirely on making blind offers, getting them under contract, finding somebody else that will make a blind offer of more than you've got it under contract for and making the difference. Got no problem with that. It's a fine way to make money. But that's not what this is. This is, I intend to buy it and renovate it. I just want to know uh, as quickly as possible what it's going to cost me to do that. Does that all make sense? I'm going to assume heads are nodding and, the, and that this all makes sense. Um, Jad, $50 a square foot. Are you cutting out early, buddy? Uh, we'll get there. $50 is not a bad number for some of them. Uh, just real quick though, here's what you're gonna get with what my numbers are per square foot. So left-hand side uh, top is the after of a foyer with some stairs, look at the rails, look at the spindles. Um, the lower is the before, right? Cheesy wood spindles, we replaced them for iron. Those things are pretty cheap, cheap stair parts. That's maybe $500 worth of material and another 500 bucks worth of labor. Uh, the right-hand side, uh, all that I'm trying to prove with the right-hand side is the importance of staging. We stage our houses. Uh, so my cost will include a couple bucks for at least a couple of pieces of uh, furniture, a desk or a chair or two. Uh, it can make a dramatic difference in the feel of a house. So look at those two photos, top and bottom. The, it's the same room, just with more light, I put in four recess lights, uh, painted the walls, staged it, and put some stuff in those empty shelves. Uh, we can talk later. You did some HVAC work there too, because um, there was a uh, stove in the back of the room. Yep, took out an old uh, heating stove and, and closed in that wall. Uh, but staging makes a, to my mind, uh, vast difference to the sellability of a house. Uh, the most important thing to me about staging is when you don't do it and all you have is an empty room, uh, people come in and nitpick the house. Is this the right paint? Do I like the look of the paint? Is, what's the gap like in the room? Uh, do the floors squeak uh, versus a home that's staged? They're walking around it, looking at it, deciding if it works, if the stuff that you've got in the room is the same size as their stuff and does the house work for them? They're just imagining being in it more than imagining what you might be making and whether or not you did the right stuff uh, and do they agree with your choices. So that's the biggest benefit. About how much do you pay for staging? Yeah, so in this area, uh, a house like this, that was a three bedroom where we staged, I think two of the three bedrooms. You see this one, I think one of the rooms was staged as a baby's room because it was really small. Uh, and some kitchen knickknacks and bathroom knickknacks Expect to pay three grand, 3,500 for a kind of basic set of stuff for this amount of stuff that you see uh, in these rooms and a couple of couple of bedrooms. Mark, I like I like what you do with the doors there. It looks like you use expensive doors, not the cheap 
the cheapest one available in the top left hand corner and looks like you use some really expensive door, not really expensive but looks like expensive door handles i was going to say if i could have found a cheaper door i probably would have used it that is a hollow two panel door uh, i guess I've technically a flat slab door might have been cheaper but you can't even find those anymore that is in stock depot stuff uh, and then you have a fan and you have a fan in the top right corner yep. and the trim looks amazing by the way so I, I think all trim looks amazing. And that might be one place where, well, one of a couple places, we probably over-renovated this house. So that is that is me having guys that I want to teach how to do stuff. I want to see what they're good at. I've got some spare stuff laying around uh, where you see like crown molding in this baby's room at, at this price point in this neighborhood for this house, wildly unnecessary. I did it because uh, I could. Uh, I would not recommend that you do that. And that actually is not included in my cost assumptions for an average rehab. Uh, we're not putting crown molding in, uh, in every bedroom, uh, but we are using those doors, those typical uh, 120, well, now I've gone up probably close to 150 uh, pre-hung door. Uh, I do step up a little bit for the door handles. Pet peeve, I don't like round cheap door handles. I like lever door handles. They are easily 30% more. So my door handle budget in this house where it could have been like $400 was probably $800, but that that's where you also get to choose for yourself if you would uh, rather be a little bit prouder of what you did or make more money. Um, if all I wanted was the money, I'd put in the round handle. I don't know, screw it, I'm stupid. I like it, I like doing this. I like- no, it looks amazing. Houses. So well, I wanted to look at it. Mark, because like for, at least from an agent perspective, anything tactile that when people are coming into the home that you're flipping and are looking to purchase that for their own personal use, that's something they're going to touch. That's something they're going to feel. That's a different experience than just the stuff that they see. I think that when you're talking about 30% more and yes, on door handles, while it might seem, oh, this is like a little frivolous. Just try to think of some of those experiences that that end buyer is going to have. And if it doesn't actually cost you that much more in your budget, it's not 30% of your whole budget, it's 30% more than maybe your just your door handle budget. It actually could create um, a much nicer experience for that buyer and make you more money overall. Um, and Jad, that door style has become a lot more popular, like the two panel door versus the six panel door, which you see a lot where it's like, three long or rectangular panels stacked on each other. Yeah, that's the stuff. I'd say that's kind of fallen out of style, but that door that Mark just showed you is basically made of the exact same thing. It just has a nicer style. Yeah. And if I may, allow me to make one other controversial statement. <laughs> uh, if, if you're just in it for uh, money, wholesale. I, I could have sold this, this house to somebody for like, $40,000. And I think we made like $90,000. But doing this 50 times a year at 10 to $40,000 would make a hell of a lot more money with a hell of a lot less stress than renovating. But I like it. So uh, that is how we got here. I uh, don't think that the only way to make money in uh, rehabbing is to actually do the rehab. Absolutely not true. Uh, you can make just as much money uh, selling your deals, accumulating some money, and then being smart like Chip and just lending it to other people uh, and not taking any of this risk. Uh, but if you're going to do it, I go out to my houses. I pay attention to what's going on. I shop for some of the stuff because I like it. So that's where some of these uh, decisions come from. Uh, and I recommend that if you're going to bother to do it, that you like it, that you like making some decisions and you like having some nice things in the house. Just don't go crazy. Again, don't build it for yourself. Uh, don't build it like uh, the most expensive, cool thing that you saw on Pinterest or HGTV. Um, always check comps, see what people are doing in other houses that are selling uh, and have it make sense uh, and obviously have it make money uh, because that is always the point. Uh, outside. Oh, okay. uh, agrees with us on the lever handles just so you know well good I, i'm glad there's some other tasteful people out there uh, i i try not to do the round handle thing i just can't do it no uh, I agree. and so, you know, 
Mark, to also play off your point, I apologize for interrupting again. That's right, good. Sometimes if you, if you're like, hey, I really want to put a footprint on this house, we're flipping it, but I'm pretty nervous about this style choice that I'm trying to make in the kitchen or this really definitive thing you're trying to do in a bathroom and you're not sure. Sometimes spending the three to maybe $600 per room for a designer can save you heartache, days on market, carrying costs, et cetera. Don't be afraid to call in the troops to really help you when you get stuck on something or say you have like a really uniquely shaped space. It could save you a lot long term and possibly even make you more money. Excellent point. It will do both of those things, by the way. Um, it will make you absolutely every time 100% confidence, more money, because every minute you aren't in the tile store looking for tile, you can be doing what actually makes you real money, uh, finding another deal, right? Uh, so to your point, everything that you can get someone else to do, you probably should, uh, so that you can spend more of your time finding and negotiating with motivated seller. But if you like it, then feel free to go and, and do a little bit of your shopping. But you're absolutely right, Danielle. And we use designers. Uh, we have designers. And they choose the majority of the stuff. And we just kind of look at it and decide if I like what got chosen and occasionally override uh, the choice. But rarely uh, because it just it makes more sense to have someone else do that uh, and we spend our time looking for deals so outside um yeah, quick point. You raise your hand <laughs> yeah i just wondered how much you should expect to pay for a designer yes uh design services major metro area uh decent designer knows what they're doing let's say five hundred dollars a room uh ought to be able to get you some choices a rendering, and maybe even a layout. So your kitchen, your designer will come take measurements uh, and say, here's you know what your kitchen layout ought to look like. And by the way, uh, even better if you can get hooked up with a uh, supplier, contractor, cabinet supplier are the two best places to find people who already have designers on staff because they have to, to get uh, kitchens designed and to get uh, cabinet layouts done. Uh, so find your cabinet supplier and they'll oftentimes have design staff either on staff or uh, easily within reach that you can use or borrow uh, for a little bit cheaper uh, than going to like a super cool fashion-y design house or like an architect. We've used architects too, but not for this kind of thing. I just need someone to tell me uh, what kind of tile looks good, what would it look like in this room, what cabinet layout fits, and what kind of makes sense for the kitchen triangle and where the island ought to be. And a designer will charge you for every room that you use them in about 500 bucks. Uh, per That's week. great. Uh, just one follow up on that. There are some agents in my market that work with builders and they kind of are really, really good at that. Um, should you consult with someone like that or somebody else in the marketplace who mostly does it commercially? I, I just didn't want to get with somebody who's just pigeonholed to work with one builder. Yeah. Um, any thoughts on that? I guess until you have your dream team built, and that actually is one of our topics, right, is how to kind of build your dream team. Uh, to a degree, more is better if you have options uh, for people that you can consult with on getting the work done, whatever the work is. So multiple designers, multiple contractors, multiple builders. Uh, but for me, I, I prefer to, and I, I think maybe this is human nature, you get comfortable with something and you kind of uh, ride the horse you got that you're comfortable with uh, in most cases. So I tend not to stray too far from the same groups of people because it works. And until it doesn't, I keep doing what works, right? So I have built a fairly small Rolodex of people and designers and contractors and suppliers uh, that works for me and I will stick with them until it doesn't work. Uh, and every once in a while, we really need the, the loyalty of a built up relationship, which obviously you don't get if you're spreading the work around a lot, right? You may get better prices by spreading the work and finding somebody who's a little bit hungrier you know, this week than uh, your other guy. Uh, but eventually something's going to go wrong 
and you're going to need a favor. So that's the other reason why I, I tend to stick to the same folks a lot, uh, because then when I really need it, I can lean on somebody and I can get a favor. Oh, thank you. Yep. Uh, who do you use for uh, bathroom towel? Yeah, me. <laughs> who do you use for cabinets is uh, me. Uh, and then Bryce Custom Cabinets, actually. Uh, well, well made point. Uh, in fact, I think that point may come up more on uh, Saturday. Be, be there on Saturday as we discuss uh, some of our favorite suppliers for things. Uh, yeah, so what are we looking at here? Some outside stuff. Real quick points. Uh, deck. Uh, that's uh, $900 with a pressure treated wood, including the framing underneath uh, and the uh, supports. That's a permitted thing, right? So you've got to get your permits for that. You got to inspect those uh, footings for uh, those posts that you put in the ground. That's probably $2,200, $2,400 at cost. So retail, $2,800. I'd, I'd build you that deck for 2,800. Uh, Mark, how long did it take for you to get the permits? 21 days to, uh, to apply and to close them out? So varies by jurisdiction. Uh, here in Fairfax though, uh, for a permit like that, simple building permit uh, that requires a relatively simple plan. Uh, I think it's now like two to three days for plan review. Uh, then that's because they're closed for COVID when the office is open. Uh, we can uh, we walk in and usually walk out same day with a permit when, when the office is open. Uh, hopefully that happens again. Uh, and, how long, and then with COVID, how long did it take now or how long did it take for the inspection once you pulled the permits? So that is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Uh, my friend, COVID has been the best thing that's ever happened to uh, inspections for people who do work. Uh, they're all done over the phone. Uh, well, in this county around here where we are in Northern Virginia, uh, our main county is over the phone. Uh, I think a lot of them are going back to in-person any day now. So when it's in person, uh, you usually try to set it up the day, two days before you need it. Uh, depending on how backed up they are, you usually get it within a day, next day, day after. And so it's normally a two to three day process, but then your inspector does show up. You're sitting around waiting for them to show up. They're walking around doing their thing. They're looking in rooms that you didn't ask them to look in uh, and it goes wherever it goes. Uh, nowadays, uh, because of COVID, inspections are done by phone and the inspectors still know what they wanna see. And if you hold the right permit and you know what you're, uh, what you're doing and what you're telling them you're doing, you're telling them the truth, they will still do a proper inspection, but it is much faster when you're walking around with a phone. And he's like, all right, show me the drain. Show me the roof, show me the, the fire blocking and you just kind of walk through quickly and they get it done. I feel like we're passing first time more often than maybe before, but it's not so much because the work um, that you showed them uh, is any uh, less inspected. Uh, it's that when they're there, they'll see other stuff. And they're like, well, that ain't right. Well, that's not on my permit. I wasn't supposed to do that. Like, well, you're touching the, the thing next to it. so. You got to do that too, right? Uh, that that comes up, and it maybe results in better work being done, but it it slows you down. You fail more inspections. So uh, right now, uh, inspections are are significantly easier, but that's going to go away soon. Uh, the world's going to go back to normal. So expect your inspection process to be three to four days on average from you know the day you start calling it in to the day hopefully you're approved for whatever it is you did and you can move on to the next step. But it just depends on how much work and what they've got to look at and if there are any problems with it and they have to come back. Uh, so outside, roof, architectural shingles. Uh, the difference between architectural and a plain three tab shingle is like a few dollars a roof. It's a couple hundred dollars difference on the average house. So always use architectural because they look a lot better. Uh, that's your, your pro tip on a roof. Uh, this particular house, a uh, little bit of trim got done because we were also doing the siding because the siding was old and metal and dented. But if it wasn't, I just paint it and the trim, we just paint it. If it's rotted, we replace the piece that's rotted, the section that's rotted. Uh, we don't usually retrim the entire house. 
this particular house. We changed out those doors from the sliders to the French door uh, because we we're also doing that work in the living room uh, and messing around in there. But when we do it, we're using in stock vinyl doors. I'm not ordering custom sized Marvin doors. We reframe around the in stock $600 depot French door, right? I will redo $300 worth of framing rather than order a $3,000 door. Uh, do you always do the roof vents instead of old school vents? If by roof vents, you mean uh, the ridge vent, Janae, at the top of the roof? Yeah. Um, so we're getting into a little esoteric construction stuff, but currently what is believed to be best practice is to have the ridge vent at the top. So where the roof makes a peak like this, you want to vent at the top of that peak. If there's a vent at the top, that means there must be a vent at the bottom for the air to get in uh, because the air escapes from the top. It enters through the bottom through the uh, eave vents or soffit vents that you would see. Well, you can't see my, I don't know, you can see my little pointer here. On the underside uh, of the roof where it overhangs the walls, uh, you would need to have vented soffits or vents there. You might technically get away with a gable vent. That's the one on the outside wall. Um, but best practice is to have the vent at the top and the bottom. So if it was there when you got there, then obviously you have to keep that system. If it wasn't there, in some jurisdictions, you can get away with just having uh, just a mechanical fan vent in the top and a gable vent in the end. Uh, but for the for the better life of the roof, the better practice is uh, a ridge vent. And by the way, uh, in addition to just doing the right thing uh, when you're directing your contractors and, and building the house, this stuff oftentimes does come up during the home inspection. A home inspector will certainly know the difference between a properly vented and not vented house. So uh, they will appreciate the ridge vent versus a completely unvented or just has one old mechanical fan uh, in the roof. And it shows up on your buyer's home inspection and maybe they bring it up, maybe they don't, maybe they have a problem, maybe they won't. We try to eliminate those problems by using better practices when we can. Uh, Question, yeah. when, you, when you did the awning, did you have to go through zoning to get that? Because you're changing the exterior of the house. Did you have to get like a zoning, like to agree that it's okay for the awning? I know up here they're like, they're sticklers. Anytime you make any changes to exterior, it has to go through zoning, which it's painful. So they'll tell you uh, in most cases. Uh, it depends on the projection. It depends on how far the setbacks are for the house. It depends on what kind of neighborhood it's in. It, that really, really depends on your municipality. Um, for here, for that one, no, because it didn't extend into anything that zoning cared about. Uh, in this case, it was all building. They just want to make sure that what you put on the house is structurally sound and stays up. Uh, that goes for things like this deck in the back as well, because we were inside of the area where a deck could be, where all you needed was the construction, the building permit, and to build it properly. Uh, but if you wanted to build that deck beyond the normal side or rear yard limits, then yeah, it could be a, a zoning thing. And if you're doing an addition uh, where you're going to tack on a two-story thing on the back of the house, it is entirely possible that during the plan review process they say, oh, yep, this needs to go to zoning uh, also because they want to be sure that you can have a two-story house 35 feet exposed on the one side in there. It, it really will depend on your, on your jurisdiction for uh, what they want. But typically, zoning um, only occurs with a large addition or when you're getting close to or on or over a property line. But it does depend on the area. Uh, outside, you'll see we did a little uh, brick work here. That's because we had the bricks there. I normally wouldn't do anything like that, but I think that brick pathway was like 50% there already. It didn't have the nice uh, four by fours around it, but I was buying a bunch of four by fours for the deck anyway. Uh, so I did it. Uh, your mileage will vary. All right. You didn't, tell us, you didn't tell us how much it was. How much what was? What was, the, what was the thing you wanted the cost on? The, the walkway? A, a brick walkway is uh, like $300. The bricks are cheap. And in my case, they were free. Uh, so it was just a, a day's worth of labor to stick them on some sand. They weren't glued to the ground or anything. 
They're just sitting on sand, which is sitting on dirt. Uh, okay, so let's start talking about some actual costs here, right? Uh, I talked about uh, coming up with a square footage. I'll talk about that more in a minute, but what I'm looking at here is trying to come up with a average per square foot cost to do the work that I typically do in a typical house. So that's a lot of typical and that's a lot of usual, but that's what this is. And I will start with the cheapest stuff, uh, which is the rental grade stuff. So when I say rental grade, I mean, these are for our properties that we rent. And in the properties that we rent, we do not fully renovate the kitchens and the bathrooms unless they are broken and do not work or are completely disgusting and inappropriate for the rent that we uh, want to achieve. Uh, or, and of course, to be good landlords, we don't own slum properties, but uh, typically if it ain't broke, we're not replacing it. Uh, so rental grade, white appliances, the lowest cost tile, Home Depot, everything. So if I'm doing a vanity in a rental property, it will be the all-in-one faucets already on it. The countertops already on it. And all I have to do is connect it to some plumbing uh, kind of fixtures. And this is also the least accurate because I, who knows? I don't fix anything if I don't have to. So there've been houses where all we did was paint it. And every once in a while we buy a house where the kitchen is shot. So it's not really a rental grade, get it ready for rent. Now it's a, a low level rehab. So that'll be the next slide, but you're looking at a house to rent out and it looks pretty clean. And all you're gonna have to do is paint it, carpet, change a couple of leaky faucets, maybe you know a couple of holes in the wall you gotta patch up. And there's always like a broken door uh, handle or broken door trim in, in every rental house it seems. Use 15 bucks a foot. So thousand square foot uh, little tiny townhouse or thousand square foot condo that you're gonna renovate 15 grand to get it painted, new carpet, fix some doors, fix a couple leaky faucets, that kind of thing, right? That's not super helpful because really it, it wouldn't even be 15 if I could get away with paint and carpet and 15 doesn't do it if I have to do a rehab to it, but that's what this is. So here's my simple rehab formula. Uh, my simple rehab is replace all the fixtures in their existing locations. So bathrooms will get new vanity, new countertop, new uh, faucet, uh, new kitchen. By new kitchen, I mean uh, cabinets in the exact same place. I'm not moving anything. Don't move, uh, not touching the electric, not touching the plumbing, other than to take the old sink out, put the new sink in, right? Maybe you would change the plates and the switches, but we're not moving anything. Uh, paint, flooring. So flooring in a simple rehab is almost always carpet. Um, it is the $2 a square foot tile, plain gray white tile, which I think you've seen in most of these photos um, in the simple rehab and the relatively simple brushed nickel fixtures. Uh, that is my entry grade carpet and hardwood, right? So this is dollar 50 something a square foot material carpet like you can get on the roll in Home Depot. Uh, hardwoods are gonna be the cheap gun stock colored two and a quarter inch red oak hardwood that you see in all houses from the fifties because that's usually what we've got. So we usually keep hardwood everywhere we can and we're only replacing it where it's really badly damaged or I'm trying to add it in a room that didn't have it. The room next door has hardwood. The kitchen had vinyl. I'm gonna run hardwood through the kitchen so I'll match what was there. Entry grade granite in the kitchen. So an entry grade granite will cost you like 40-ish dollars a square foot maybe from your local granite guy um, or depot. I find granite uh, suppliers um, can usually meet or beat depot because a lot of times they'll have remnants. Um, so if you can get a remnant, meaning a leftover piece from their last job. You always wanna to try to do that, especially in the bathroom. So that's why it pays to actually ask, uh, have your granite guy or have your contractor ask their granite guy if they have any remnants in decent looking colors that are popular lately that you can have the leftover piece for, for your kitchen or for your bathroom. Kitchen's tough because sometimes you need more than, uh, than average and it's hard to have enough leftover for a big kitchen, but you never know. And two dollar square foot tile maybe in the bathrooms, right? Not the fancy stuff, 
Doesn't have a little gold leaf or anything built into it. Plain, neutral tile. That's better for you anyway. If you want to get fancy, get fancy in your own bathroom. Uh, in a rehab bathroom, white tile. And if you want to get fancy, put a fancy uh, decorative tile in the niche, right? Or maybe do like a little accent band at eye level with the $15 a square foot little glass tile. Uh, but you know, get your contractor or designer to tell you what to choose for that. Uh, and definitely do that. Don't do that everywhere. And then the last thing is um, this amount will have on average, average house, about four grand worth of other thing that seems to come up I, at least once in every house. So four grand is like most of your roofing budget on a townhouse or small single family, or most of your heat and AC budget if you had to replace uh, the HVAC in a house, uh, which sometimes happens, right? We buy houses that are 50 years old and have 30 year old uh, AC units that the seller didn't tell me about. Usually they do, usually we ask, so usually we know, but Simple Rehab uh, has that extra four grand in there for something, $30 a square foot. So let's do some real quick math here. Danielle, what, what would you say is the average size of an old 1950s Northern Virginia Rambler house? I'd say about 2,100 to 2,300 square feet, including a basement. That's a that's about right. That that's about the the average size I think that uh, that I'm seeing. So a twenty three hundred dollar house uh, times thirty dollars a square foot is sixty nine thousand dollars. That means I'm saying for sixty nine thousand dollars I can replace all of the kitchen, the two and a half bathrooms that we see in our average Rambler, paint the whole thing, um, replace all the floors, carpets anywhere there was carpet, refinish the hardwoods if it's got hardwood, maybe add hardwood in the kitchen if it's got linoleum. I could probably do that. For that amount of money, change out all the lights um, in the switches, uh, change out all the, you know, the outlets and the plates, and I'll still have four grand left over to put towards the roof or the AC unit and a couple of bucks to clean up the outside, um, throw some grass seed down, throw down a dozen bags of mulch, uh, pull out the old nasty stuff and plant you know, $400 worth of uh, cheap green bushes uh, that a regular contractor can do uh, you don't even need a landscaper for it, but if you want to get fancy, get a, a landscaper. Uh, they can buy mulch in bulk uh, and save you a couple bucks if you need a lot of it. Uh, but typically, we can get away with just a few bags. Uh, so that is that is what, on average, I would say you could expect to spend on a simple rehab in this area uh, to touch a lot of the visible stuff in the house. Make sense? Move on. Basic remodel. So what I'm calling a basic remodel is everything I just talked about in the simple rehab. Plus, I'm now going to replace the doors and the trim. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and just say this is probably 99% of our remodels. When I get a house, I seem to always have to replace the doors and windows because uh, they're stuck or they're old, or they're broken, or they're you know, uninsulated, and they're fogged up. Uh, we're replacing windows at like $300-ish a piece on average for a white vinyl window uh, with the two sashes that go up and down. Uh, and then real quick, Janae, to answer your question, uh, GFIs with breakers, uh, uh, and short answer is yes. Uh, if you are replacing the outlets anywhere where there's water, like a kitchen or a bathroom, you must use either a GFI outlet or a GFI uh, breaker uh, in the box that protects that circuit. But this does not include making wholesale changes to the electric. Uh, we'll get to that. Uh, but that does include using yeah, the $22, $25 a piece GFI outlets uh, in kitchens and bathrooms uh, because we have to do it. Uh, so basic remodel is my simple rehab. I'm adding doors, I'm adding trim. I'm also assuming in the basic remodel now, I'm trying to add a little value. I'm gonna make some changes to things to make it better. So I'm gonna move a wall or two. I'm gonna open up the kitchen, right? Everybody wants open concept. So this is where you take the wall down to the kitchen between the kitchen and the dining room to have like a little bar top or to make it open or take the wall down between the living room so that you can kind of see things. 
That probably means I need to get that engineer to come out, give him 400 bucks to at least look around and tell me I'm safe. Maybe another 400 bucks to draw it up if I actually want to take down something that is structural uh, to make the space more open. Uh, I'm going to be doing some minor plumbing to kind of reconfigure a thing. If the uh, uh, sink is over in the corner and I want the sink in the island or under the window or somewhere that I think is going to be better or that my designer thinks will look better and feel more modern, this allows me to move some plumbing and electric around to do that. Uh, and now I've got 8,000 worth of extra dollars built in for the roof or the HVAC or a walkway or to recover the driveway. And this at $44 a square foot is more like what you were seeing uh, in those photos, right? Where you can see I painted the outside, I did the doors, I did the trim. So now our $2,300 2300 square foot average rambler in the DC metro area at $44 a square foot, $101,200. So about a hundred grand uh, to remodel and try to add some value to a house, not just replace all the visible stuff that you see. And I would say that's about right. Um, can you do it for less? Absolutely. Can you do it for more? Completely. I'd love to charge you more. Uh, but if you're using the materials that I use and trying to meet the market uh, where you typically need to in major metropolitan areas uh, where you pay what we pay uh, for materials and labor, 44 bucks a foot, about 100 grand for the basic remodel of a house kind of gets you there. show you one more and then we can double back for kind of what things may be included or don't include. Major remodel. So major remodel, everything that you just saw in the basic remodel, plus definitely the roof, definitely the AC, definitely some kind of deck or porch or exterior thing happening. Uh, now I am assuming I will be completely gutting every bathroom, every kitchen, uh, every finished area in the basement. I'm looking for extra stuff that's not in this house to add to it. I'm going to try to add a bedroom in the basement uh, in DC. Every rentable square foot is good, right? If I can build uh, a rentable uh, space in the basement of a DC row house, I've just added $40,000, $50,000 to the value uh, of the house. If there's any unfinished area in the house, I'll finish it. If it's already there in the basement, finish it. Usually in this metro area, I get more than my cost back by finishing anything that's unfinished. This is where uh, I will dig into the slab to add a bathroom. If I've got that bedroom in the basement, but it doesn't have a bathroom, but the plumbing is kind of over there in the corner, dig it up. We'll spend a couple grand, dig up the slab, uh, put a full bathroom in where there's a full bedroom, uh, because that makes that lower level now more habitable. Maybe this now can be like the au pair suite or granny suite, or more likely where you stuff your teenager. Uh, those things add value in certain markets at certain times in certain houses. So these are decisions that I need to make before obviously I commit to buy the house, but that's what my due diligence and research is for. So I'm looking at the house, I'm looking at the neighborhood, I'm deciding based on what I know about the house and what I know about the house that sold across the street that another rehabber did, do I need to try to add a bedroom? Because he had four, three, I've got three, two. If I've got about the same square footage, I can see what his house looked like. Does my house uh, get that same amount if I do that same amount of work? Uh, those are the decisions that you need to make. But for a major remodel, this allows me to do most all of those things. It's not an addition, but it is short of an addition adding things that don't already exist to an existing house in the way of finished spaces, big kitchens, bathrooms where there aren't currently bathrooms, that kind of thing. Doing that, I'm saying 58 bucks a square foot. So if we go back to our math machine, 2,300 times $58 a square foot, $133,400. So have a budget of 130 grand if you intend to take some walls down and finish an unfinished basement and add a bedroom and bathroom in the basement where one doesn't currently exist, replace your full HVAC system uh, inside and out, 
add a little uh, fun deck to the back or porch to the front if having nice outdoor areas is what makes sense uh, for your house in your neighborhood at your price point, right? Uh, that is what we're spending on average to do that. Uh, and actually, I think I lied. Uh, because we had to put the deck on the back and that little porch thing on the front, the house that you were looking at was really more of this major remodel for me. Uh, but I did know that going in that we in, uh, had intended to put that deck on the back and that uh, little doodad on the front. Uh, of course, you can go into a thing and change your mind. Uh, you can assume you're doing a regular remodel and then move yourself into a major remodel. This still works if you want to kind of make that decision and say, all right, I assumed I was going to spend X and get Y. If I spend X plus, will I get Y plus? Uh, this is still kind of helpful to do that, but I hope if you're already on the house uh, and you're making that decision, you'll get a full scope from your, your contractor to know exactly what it's going to cost you to do. Uh, and a real estate agent to make sure that spending the money is going to be worth your while. You know, you want to make sure you're getting your ROI on any of those bigger things that you choose to do. Million percent. Real estate agent is one of the top people in your dream team, right? They're helping you find deals. They're helping you sell houses. They're helping you understand what's going on in the market. Uh, definitely need to lean on uh, your agent team uh, to tell you what you should be doing. Hourly labor costs in your market. $35 to $65 an hour. Uh, depending on what they do, right? Uh, a guy that just digs holes for plants, you can probably get for 20, uh, but they're, they're hard to find right now. Uh, you, you're actually not as likely to just run to the depot with a pickup truck and get guys anymore uh, at what you might expect to pay to get work. You're gonna have to work a little bit harder uh, to find contractors, all of which are busy. Uh, all of which have uh, more projects than they can probably take on at the moment. Uh, so that is reflected in the price. That's where we are in the cycle right now. That's where we are in the market. And that is another uh, uh, factor from the pandemic. Everybody's at home right now staring at their walls thinking how they can make their house better and needing a home office. So we're busy. Uh, They're not traveling and using that money to improve their space instead. Exactly right, exactly right. So I would say on average, uh, you're paying between $35 to $65 an hour uh, for $35 in for paint, carpet, drywall, putting up cabinets, $65, $75 an hour or more for plumbing, electric, HVAC. If you're, if you're doing it on a... Uh, material and labor basis. If you're doing HVAC work, my guess is most cases you're calling a contractor or an HVAC guy and saying, hey, I need a new heat and AC unit. How much? I can tell you it's about six grand right now for the average small house heat and HVAC system. So that's baked in. In my major remodel, I'm assuming I'm doing that anyway. That's in there at 58 bucks a foot. Yeah. So Mark, we had a question from Edric. Rough idea on construction schedule uh, and duration for each of the levels of renovation, um, which is a really great question. Excellent question. Yeah, how long does it take to spend this amount of money? So yeah, definitely a function of your quality of contractor and how many people they are staffing your project with and how good they are. But I can tell you in my experience, uh, looking at that house that I showed you the uh, photos of that was a two level, three bedroom, four bedroom, three bath house with some work done kind of on every surface and the outside. Um, that was a three and a half month project. So 90, 100 days uh, to do. That's just your construction part. Just construction. So that, that's that, happening then getting photos, your realtor. Right stuff where you're actually going on the market. That's just from hammer to hammer. That's right. That was that was 90 to 100 days of construction. And by the way, um, I don't think this is really super helpful, but it just kind of works out that way. On average, uh, a lot of the, the people that do this uh, use four to six man crews. And I can tell you from experience, on average, a four to six man crew 
working 50 to 60 hour weeks, so you know, five days, maybe Saturday, um, you can probably spend about 10 grand a week uh, on a house. Uh, and you probably should be spending about 10 grand a week if you're making good time on your house. Some weeks will be more, some weeks will be less, depending on if that week you ordered cabinets, right? But on average, uh, a, a, a four to six man crew uh, working a, a reasonable rate uh, is gonna be burning through about 10 grand a month of your, your budget to do the work, right? So contracting tip then, if you've got a $50,000 budget for your thing, uh, you probably don't need to put more than $20,000 down on this thing to get your guy going because that'll get him through the first couple of weeks. Uh, and you can't really spend a lot of money in the first couple of weeks anyway. The first couple of weeks, you're tearing stuff out, right? Uh, so that's just another kind of point of order for how to structure your, uh, your actual contracts with your contractor. Uh, but 10K yeah. a week. 10, 10K a week is a good, is a good rate to use. Thank so you. this, this project took a hundred days. I think we spent probably 10, 10 weeks, 10K a week, 130, 140 grand. Uh, I'd say that's about right. So major remodel, that was uh, on average about, about 90 days if you're ripping everything out and doing it right and getting it inspected and getting permits. Uh, so the uh, basic remodel then, you know, you we're doing that in 45 to 60 days. And then the basic rehab where we're not moving anything, we're just taking it off the wall, putting it back in the wall, you can get that done in 30 days. Uh, less, I've seen guys do it in a week if they have a 10 man crew and you know exactly what you're doing, you buy the same thing every time, you've got a lot of your material already on hand and you've done the same exact bathroom you know, 50 times, uh, you can do it in a couple of weeks. I wouldn't count on that. Count on if you're doing this for your first half a dozen deals and you're using you know, contractors that maybe you meet here uh, that do this on average, they're not gonna likely get your whole house uh, renovation done in a couple of weeks, at least a month for touching every surface, even if you're not making major changes to it. Uh, and then hopefully they get it done in that amount of time. I don't know, Jad may, Jad may argue that that's impossible, uh, but you can get it done. How long did the Annandale house take you? Did you tell us? Yeah, that Annandale house was like a hundred days, three and a half months. Wow. Uh, all right, so where did we get that, that square footage number, right? Let's talk about that for a second. So I wanna come up with a number that I can use. Uh, and I haven't been to this house. I'm talking to the seller on the phone. The agents called me up and said, hey, here's, here's an address. You wanna buy it. Wholesaler sends you a thing uh, through the email. Hey, I've got this house in, uh, in whatever county you wanna buy. it." Couple of different ways to get your square footage information. Just know that what we're trying to do is come up with the highest logical number that you think you can justify. Uh, the multiple listing service will often have pretty good information on this. Uh, sometimes, oftentimes, more information than you're gonna get from even your Zillow realtor type uh, listing services. That's why we have and suggest everyone have access to the MLS. Get back to Danielle's point. You need to have an agent on your team anyway, so they should have access to the MLS and can help you with these things. So you're looking for total square footage or what we see a lot is the uh, abbreviation ABV grade fin above grade finish uh, number. If you see above grade finish, that usually means um, if it's a typical two level house where you've got one uh, that you can kind of see, you know, most of the level of the house and a basement, the above grade finished is the above the dirt level. If it's a three-story house, you've got two above grade, one below. Uh, that's important because if that's the only number you get, you have to try to figure out how much is below grade. And if it's a two-level house and the above grade is 900, I'd say make times two, right? That's, we see that a lot. The basement is about the same square footage as the first floor your typical square rambler. So take the above grade, multiply it times two. Total square footage, if you can get it, that's usually a pretty good number. It usually includes the total square footage of the house. Uh, just know that if you do get it from the MLS and it's in the listing, 
it was probably put there by an agent. They're not always the most accurate measurers of square footage. Uh, you don't know exactly where they got it, but hopefully they got it from some kind of reliable source and maybe their seller uh, took some measurements for you. Next place you can go is the tax records, right? So whether you have MLS access or not, most areas have public free access uh, to their property tax records. Hopefully they're somewhat accurate. The kind of things you're looking for in your tax record are total building area, total fin or finished square feet. They will also oftentimes list the unfinished square feet. So it may say carport or den or basement or unfinished area. Uh, sometimes you can, if you have the aerial or a photo, you can say, okay, I can see what they're talking about at den. They added this like three season room thing on the back of the house. Fine, if I can see it, if it's got a roof over it, I'm counting it because I'm probably gonna touch it. I'm gonna paint it. I'm gonna fix the rod on the outside of it. I'm gonna try to put a floor in it. And if I'm doing a major remodel, I'm gonna replace all the windows in it. So if you can identify it as real square footage that exists under the roof, whether it's currently finished or not, include it in your number. Uh, base square footage. And if it has a number for BSMT, that's the basement, add that number. Take any of the small numbers you can find and add them together to try to get that lump sum total uh, square footage. That makes sense. If you're looking at a house and you'll just have to kind of get used to measuring and doing things, and this is part of your homework, go out this weekend to an open house with a digital tape measure. If you want to be sneakier about it, a plain tape measure, if uh, you won't get kicked out. Uh, and start measuring houses. Get used to looking at, all right, that's about 20 feet. This is about a 100 square foot room. This is about a, a 600 square foot floor. Uh, you just have to start doing it to kind of get used to it. Uh, but what you're trying to do is get to a number that makes sense. And if you've got a two level rambler and that all adds up to 6,000 square feet, it's probably too much. Uh, 6,000 times $58 a square foot will have your budget a little higher than it needs to be. Uh, for a rehab remodel. Uh, but usually I can find it one way or another. In the MLS, tax record, agent, owner, reasonable ballpark, uh, I can figure out roughly what the uh, under roof square footage is. Uh, and that's what I'm using for my square footage area. Uh, hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, yeah, so the other thing about tax records, uh, is they may not always be 100% accurate, but at least in most areas, they're consistent. And where I find that they're the least accurate and consistent is in cities because they're older, right? Uh, they were not doing it uh, completely exactly to begin with, and the records haven't gotten better in the last 50 years. So the older the house is, usually the less accurate your tax record is going to be. The newer the house is, then conversely, with newer homes. Newer homes are all subject to the current building and planning process where the builder submitted that plan and the, the town folk had that plan with the exact square footage of what that house is going to be. They dropped that right in the tax record, so the tax record that you've got is highly accurate. Uh, so stands to reason the older it is, uh, usually the less dependable, but newer stuff uh, is usually fairly dependable and is at least consistent enough if they don't ever include the unfinished mechanical room uh, in your county, then they're not going to do it anyway. So as long as it's the, the same basis that you're using on a regular basis, it'll work. Uh, and then the last uh, bit is uh, use your low fly aerials. Uh, you can get those aerial views. Uh, on the multiple listing service, Google, Google Earth uh, has a really good aerial uh, service that you can zoom in on houses and spin it around and see all four sides and see the projections and get a really good sense for at least the outside envelope of a house without ever stepping foot in. Uh, and that again is the goal of what we're trying to do. Uh, with okay. that, let me see if I've missed any questions. Danielle, did I miss anything? A really good one from Neetha, um, which, no, Neetha, no one, we haven't talked about this yet. And she asked, I'm sorry, blah, blah, uh, what if you, ha have you ever bought a home that was a complete teardown? If yep. not, would you ever take one on and tear it down? If so, what sort of price per square foot would it be in Northern yep. Virginia? 
All right. So let's let's spitball because that's that's what this is now, right? If we're talking yeah. about uh, additions and new construction, uh, less accurate than even these other ones. But if I were going to take a number, uh, I would say in this area, in major metros, probably roughly the same, for uh, new construction of an entire house, I'd use $125 a square foot. Uh, if it is a, what I'd call an urban house, meaning uh, city sewer, city water, you can connect to the usual things. You've got a decent sized lot that you can work with, you know, to, to do the grading and dig a basement and that kind of thing. Uh, but, I would also argue though with that, Mark, you're yeah. probably not in Arlington. No. You're probably not in Old Town Alexandria. Yeah. You're in uh, Herndon or, or Prince William County or most parts of Loudoun County. Um, it can depend, like keep that in mind as well as we're talking about uh, this because in certain counties, uh, what you're going to build will also require different finish levels. Like if you're building a 1.7 1 or $2 million home in Arlington, that's going to be a much higher price per square foot. I like, I just sold one today. The price per square foot ended up being about $165, $175 per square foot, but yep. that's in like the heart of Arlington and it sold for a little over 1.7 million. Yep. So what Mark's talking about is a, um, a more middle of the ground market. So it's really important to keep that in mind too. Completely. And then that's why you, there really is no such thing as a number for new construction. You have to take all of those things into consideration. The ballpark. What, kind of, what kind of grade do you have? Do you have to do a lot of work to the lot to be able to build on it? Is the soil any good? What kind of foundation do you need? If it's not on public water and sewer, what's it cost to get a well or a septic? There's a lot of other things to consider for new construction. Uh, in addition, maybe a little bit less, but again, it also depends on what's going in the addition. If what's going in your addition is a kitchen and a bathroom, you're gonna spend a hell of a lot more square foot than if what you're putting in your addition is just a bedroom. So I can build a bedroom addition on a block foundation for maybe 60, $65 a square foot. If all it is is some framing, drywall, or a roof and a basic foundation, uh, not much to it. So it really, really depends on what you're building to build. Uh, renovating, there's really only so much you can do. Once you tear the drywall off and go down to the studs, there's, there's just only so many variables that you can have on a per square foot basis. That's why I like rehabs, uh, because they're a lot more contained in what you can, can have to get into. Uh, new construction, you know, really the, the sky is the limit uh, with what you can do. Uh, uh, Edric had a great question about contingency. So you saw in my numbers there uh, at my $44 a square foot number, I'll back up a little bit. Uh, there, we'll pass it. If $44 a square foot has a uh, $8,000 kind of random extra thing that I haven't really fully identified going on, uh, that's what that's 18% uh, kind of random extra thing factor. Uh, that feels about right, right? You want, you want a near 15, 20% fudge factor built into something like this. Again, the point of this exercise is making an offer on a house, talking to a seller, talking to an agent, working with a wholesaler, figuring out what I might want to pay for this house before I actually go out uh, and look at it. Once I've looked at the house and gone over it with a reputable contractor who I trust to give me a reasonable number and do what they say they're going to do, then I can lower my contingency to maybe eight, 10 percent. Uh, you always want something because there's always going to be something. Or once you step foot into a house and start swinging a hammer, something will happen that you didn't account for. Uh, but usually, if you kind of know what you're doing and your contractor knows what they're doing, you can keep that contingency to usually eight to 10%. Uh, so eight to 10% when you're actually, you know, fully scoped and have an actual viable number, I'm at like 18% uh, here, which 
I think is safer. Uh, Which is <laughs> Jad, stop talking people out of rehab. <laughs> Just stick with rental. Rentals are great. You can still make money in rehab. Do, I think what Jad was referring to, if I'm reading some of the comments correctly, is more of uh, offer strategy and contingencies when either accepting offers as a seller or presenting uh, offers with contingencies when you're purchasing a property. If I kind of read that, I read it. No, I, I just think that I just think that all I've been doing my 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 entire adult career has just been doing buy, repair, refinance, repeat. I've built a pretty good portfolio. And with the pandemic, I started flipping. Flipping is so hard. It just is. Like, like I just like, I, like two hours ago when we started, I just told you, like the budget that you know Mr. Beckett is giving is, I mean, amazing. But I mean, when we go into practicality and you start walking it with your GC and your GC knows that you're a newbie, I mean, you're not gonna know what the heck he's talking about. You're not gonna be like, well, Mr. Beckett says it's $44 a square foot. You'd be like, then go hire Mr. Beckett. I'm like, well, I will, but he's probably too busy. But um, I know I'm just trying to tell you, like as a guy who's currently doing 10 rehabs simultaneously, it's really, really hard. Like that's um, also, Jed, I commend you because 10 rehabs simultaneously, like that's but, not small. That's not you're probably just doing two, just back on what Mr. Beckett was talking about. It's just that like your contractors will lie to you. I'm doing a flip right now on Glen Burnie. My, my, my contractor told me it only cost $38,000. It goes live hopefully this Sunday. He just came back to me and said, Mr. Jad, we need a new water heater. Okay, that's $800. Oh, by the way, I think we should power wash the house. Okay, that's another $800. Oh, by the way, the house looks disgusting from outside. We need to do landscaping. How much is that going to cost? Well, I priced it out in two different quotes. One was $7,000, one was $8,000. But don't worry, me and my crew will do it for you. The material is only going to cost $3,000. And we're going to charge you $2,000 for labor. So that's another $5,000. So here we went from a $38,000 budget. Now we're up to fifty-five, dollars you know, overnight. And this guy's supposed to be, you know, he's been doing it forever. So I'm just like, all I'm just trying to like- No, oh, I would be frustrated if I were you too. Here, here's what I would recommend to you. And this is not meant to be a pitch to work with me, but let's just be real. If when your contractor comes to you and says, you should spend this money, this isn't looking right, not broken, not, not safe, not, not working, right? Like something that they are giving an opinion on value based on presentation leverage another team member like a realtor you should always be passing this off to somebody else and saying hey if i do this are the comps justifying this is this justifiable and you should do that research yourself as well but hey throw it off of somebody somebody like me or someone on my team or any other realtor anyone you feel comfortable with that. jad i'll even do that for you from georgia i think you need a vacation yeah. and i think we need to all pitch in and send you wherever how about turks and caicos it's close to us mm. you earned oh, yeah. it buddy Oh my you're God. Doing, doing like, so one budget and you start calculating and then just stuff just keeps, just mm -hmm. keeps coming. Like that's the thing. The or other should... thing I would tell you is you need to better leverage this forum. Group. Uh, you yeah. should be getting contractors from <laughs> other investors that you may know, or at least contractors that want to work with other investors uh, and maintain a reputation and not lie to you. Uh, so ask for them here or in other local RIAs where you're working uh, and try to get you know better people. Uh, it, because at first, $800 for the water heater, not bad, $800 for pressure washing, you're still within my 18% uh, kind of fudge factor for contingency. $5,000 in landscaping sounds like bullshit, but I don't know, I'd have to find, I'd have to see your situation. But yeah. have, a, have a referred contact for everything if you can. Uh, which gets me to the pitch for, is it next month, maybe? That dream team? I don't know. We'll get there. Uh, we'll talk about building dream teams and why it's important uh, for reasons exactly like that. Uh, but since it's already pretty late, hit me with the remaining questions for this topic so that we're not here till our typical midnight because I'll keep this here all night. <laughs> well, in this topic in particular, I know there's always tons of questions, really valid questions, and it's super detailed. It's hard to give you finite answers to every possible circumstance you could come into as you know an investor a flipper a rehabber uh, a long-term buy and hold rental owner uh but hopefully this has asked, answered a lot of your questions that you guys have had i have like one last question for uh, mark if i can 
Mark, so I'd love to start using your company because obviously your work looks amazing. Can you can you kindly tell us the what you would charge? So the rehab, what it cost you for Annandale and what you would charge an investor who was to use you? Because I have like good leads on houses in False Church. And, um, you know, I think that you'd be obviously perfect if you have the time. I know that you're super busy. So best way to get a hold of me uh, is email in the chat box, by the way. Uh, another reminder, three little dots there at the bottom right hand corner of the chat box. You can save it with everybody's contact information. Um, and yeah, send me information. I can do the same thing uh, for contracting as I do for myself for investing. Send me as much as you've got, as many photos as you can uh, of the thing and I can take a look at it and, and we can talk about it. And then obviously if it moves forward, uh, and you get serious about it, we can go take a look at it and we can tell you what we do. Happy to do it. Yeah, I can't wait to get those lever handles. I don't want this, I don't want the knobs anymore. I want your famous lever. You went past it. <laughs> I can't wait to see your pictures from the beach. If we can yes. uh, talk you into it, we will. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. While you're thinking of your, your last possible questions, if you've got them. I, I'm going to make another pitch for for Saturday uh, for anyone who wasn't here uh, because it's free for crying out loud. Uh, this Saturday, the 6th, 8.30 to 4, uh, we will be going at it all day long with different panels talking about all kinds of cool stuff, uh, all kinds of really smart, busy, uh, money-making people who are going to tell us uh, how they're finding deals, what kind of technology are they using, what do their houses look like, what kind of pieces and materials do they put in their houses, what do they do with the money they make, how do they make money on their money and not pay taxes on it, well, not not pay taxes, less taxes, we're not going to Wesley Snipes on this thing, but uh, we'll, we'll try to give you the best advice we can, uh, and it is kind of our bigger annual sort of roll up of a lot of the things that we discuss over the course of the year here um, that we try to do in one day with a bunch of our friends who do what we do. Uh, so it's going to be awesome. I would highly recommend that you check it out. Uh, you do have to sign up for it. I think we will eventually maybe uh, have recordings of it available, but you probably have to pay for that. So uh, sign up for it if you can make it. Uh, we'd love to see you out there on Saturday. With that, what's the other... sign up for it? The sign up is, yes, great, thank you. Sign up is at gridinvestor.com slash gridconnect2021 or just Google Grid Connect 2021. It should be the top result. That's how I found it. Uh, and it will be uh, uh, sign ups in there. Oh, look at that. Shows up right in the chat log. There you go. Save the chat log. Grid Connect 2021 uh, is in there. Uh, and share the recording of this. Yes, we're working on that. I think if you go to gridinvestor.com, if not now, very soon, uh, we will have ways that you can see the recordings of these very presentations uh, so that you can spread the knowledge. Oh, and speaking of spreading the knowledge, I got that. I'm hopping back again. Everybody brace for another screen share. And which one is it? That one? Yeah. Bam. Bam. Bam, do this for us. Uh, if you got any value out of this at all, uh, tell people. Uh, it always will shamelessly plug for reviews on Meetup uh, where you may have found us. Uh, anywhere else you are talking to other people who invest. Uh, tell them that we exist. Tell them that we're not just here, uh, that we have partners of ours all over the place from Athens, Georgia to uh, California and uh, other locations coming soon. Uh, people who do things the way that we do them and present information the way that we uh, present it uh, are doing this in, in other places where you can get a different perspective. Uh, and you will hopefully soon be able to get that perspective in a room again, where we can actually network, hang out, talk about your deal, trade business cards. I really want to get back into a room. I think we'll always maintain some kind of online presence, but this really works best we'll get more deals, you'll get more deals, we'll all get more business and make more money when we can actually kind of network again. Um, but that is why we believe the power is in the network and it will get better the more that we grow. So tell everybody that this thing exists and that maybe they'll pick up something or two. 
uh, and hopefully uh, show up for the, the next meeting uh, and connect with us there. Yeah, and next month um, we will be discussing how to negotiate the deal, identify and qualify motivated sellers. So again- Hugely important. Hugely, hugely important. A personal favorite topic of mine just because it's my daily activities basically. Um, but being able to understand target and speak with a motivated seller is really the only way that any investor can get deals. And we're going to be doing that next month on Tuesday, April 6th. Uh, so you can go on meetup and sign up there and, uh, we'll see you next month. Awesome. Well, any last questions from anybody before we break for the evening? I know this was a lot and well, we're kind of networking. We're networking and asking questions. I'm looking at my stupid mug from, I don't know what event that was. So surly, going back to this one. Uh, last chance. And if not, it's not your last chance, by the way. It's never your last chance. If anyone ever wants to follow up on anything, uh, I will give you another 10 seconds to go to the little dots at the bottom corner of the chat box uh, and save that chat. My contact information is in there. Danielle's contact information is in there. Uh, if you ever want to talk about how to uh, get these deals in front of you or renovate them uh, or sell them. Uh, Danielle would be happy to help. I'd be happy to help. It's why we're here. Uh, and with that, thank you all very much then for coming out this evening. And I hope to see you, uh, if not Saturday, uh, hopefully here again soon. All right. For sure. Cool. For sure. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all very much. Have a great evening. You too. You have thank one. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.